so as long as the jury's out, we should probably discuss that. I would like to provide the defendant and the court with a copy. So that had to be that had to be said. So it's the defendant. That's not how it was said. That, that was how I said. You want to run the record back? Mr. Brooks. So I'm the only one. I got one. Mr. I got Brooks. one ear that work, and I heard that. This on, is man. to benefit on, you so it, that no, you not. understand. I got to tell you something. When Sue Opera says the defendant, that's classic. What's going on, everyone? You're watching Sight Sounds Flavors on YouTube, SightSoundsFlavors.com. If at any point in time you like this video, smash that like button. As always, guys, please leave a comment down below because it's your comments that inspire me to make new videos. And at any point in time, if you like the video, smash that like button. And I may have said that, but I'll say it again. Smash that like button. So, guys, I got to be honest with you. Uh, you know, in another clip, Sue explains why she said the defendant real loud like that, but uh, it was hilarious. I got to be honest with you. I don't like Darrell Brooks. I wouldn't piss on him if he was on fire, but I got to be honest with you. When he says, I got one ear and I heard that, that was his typical, you know, victim attention getting, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, Darrell Brooks Jr. At, at, at his worst, but that was a clever comment. You know, and the, the, the face of indignation on him. I mean, mind you, he is being charged. He's being tried for one of the most heinous crimes in Wisconsin history and probably one of the most heinous crimes in U.S. history, if not world history. But there he is, that sense of entitlement, that, that, that center of the universe vibe, that narcissism to the core. You know, I got one ear and I could hear that and you could. I mean, it, it's almost like, you know, Poor Darrell Brooks Jr. You know that that Sue Opera would 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 uh, disrespect you like that. That she would say the defendant. I mean, you know, cry me a river. You know, it's it's just it's mind boggling to use a derelism because again, I mean, you know, that he would take exception. That he would think that the judge would care or that the media would care or that we would care is quite frankly mind boggling. You know what I mean? But again, it, it just goes back to this whole, you, you got to almost ask yourself, what was his upbringing like? You know, what did Dawn do for him as a mom? Did she coddle him? Did she, you know, uh, reinforce his feeling that he had to be the center of the universe? Because again, it, it, only somebody like Gerald Brooks Jr. I mean, you look at, uh, at the Night Stalker, or you look at the Iceman, or you look at Bundy, or you look at these other people... And it's almost like they they uh, took the um, the scorn and the ridicule and the, the the condemnation of the judges and the prosecutors, the way the jurors looked at them, the questions the media asked them, and they kind of took it in because they were serial killers or professional hitmen, and so they didn't dwell or focus in on what they perceived to be disrespect. But the reality of the matter is that Darrell Brooks Jr. one hundred and ten percent could not remove himself and say to himself, I am facing a prosecution that is carrying the anger and the sorrow of, of, of countless people in the Waukesha community. I am constantly interacting with bailiffs who probably know people that I hurt. I'm looking at jurors that they probably had to do voir dire and impanel, you know, and go through great lengths to find an impartial jury because they probably also know people that I harm. You know, he could just never remove himself from the situation and, and, and just kind of look, you know, from afar at what was going on. He never, even when he very first spoke in the trial, he said, finally, people are going to hear the other side. You guys have heard a lot of stuff, but now you're going to hear from me. I think that he maybe thought that the jury was stupid or maybe thought that this jury was in fact completely, you know, unknowing of what was going on and that he was somehow going to be able, even though he's not a lawyer, even though he's never had any courtroom experience like that, that he was going to be able to give the jury an alternate narrative of what happened, so much so that they might potentially exonerate him and that he might walk out of there. And it's just honestly crazy to me because, again, you know, all the woman did, all Sue Opper did was she said defendant a little bit louder and this guy could not take it. This guy had to make a point to the judge. He had to make a point to the jury and to the media and to everybody that Sue Opper disrespected him 
by putting a little bit more emphasis on one of the many words that she was saying. And all she was trying to say was, look, the jury is not in the room. Let's take advantage to do this, this, and this. She wasn't, and she was even bringing him a document to make sure that he was able to see what the court was able to see. You know, transparency, discovery, courtroom procedure, courtroom etiquette, courtroom decorum, whatever you want to call it. She was not trying to pull a fast one. She was not trying to intentionally disrespect Raul Brooks Jr. And she even tried to explain it later. Look, she's got a hearing issue. She gets up. She's away from the microphone. There's like a bit of an echo there. But Gerald Brooks Jr. was looking for anything that he could say, look, right there, I'm being disrespected. And this was one of the examples. And, and amongst those of us that watch the trial, you know, there's mind boggling and rush to judgment. There's the truth. That's why I've got a new channel called Truth TV. We're going to talk about, you know, shenanigans and ridiculous defendants like Gerald Brooks Jr., uh, police stops with just, you know, dumb crimes, dumb statements, you know. But, uh, but no, but so we have all these things that we say because of things that he said, but I got to be honest with you, the defendant is probably one of the most classic lines in this whole thing that we talk about, because again, it, it just, you know, here's a guy that could spend the next thousand years in prison. Here's a guy that in a state that had the death penalty, Wisconsin may have it. I don't know, but you know, he didn't get it, but it would be a death penalty offense or a, a multiple life sentence offense. And here he is, you know, dwelling on the fact that Sue Opper said the word defendant a little bit louder. And it just gives you some context. And I think context is very important. You know, people say, oh, you talk so much. Well, get over it because that's what this channel is all about. It's not just commentary, but I also like to ask you guys questions. And, you know, a lot of the questions over the years, because I've been talking about this now for a couple of years, and we're going back to the original video collection from Sight Sounds Flavors that I did pull down and that I do have and I could re-upload, but I don't want to do that. I want to make videos based on what I know now as opposed to what I knew then. And the context of it is very important. And I think a lot of the comments that we have received on this channel, as well as everything else channel on YouTube, and I'm sure we're going to receive on the new channel, Truth TV, really speak to the point that I don't think... That there, I think that there were times during the trial where he just didn't realize where he was at. And I wouldn't call that insanity by any stretch of the imagination. I would call it delusion. I think he was delusional. I think that he believed that he was the victim and maybe used that as a shield. Because again, you got to realize prosecution team was three people. Defense was one. He fired his lawyers. He could have had two lawyers and maybe a paralegal. He could have had a, a legal team, not a dream team like OJ, but some sort of a team, somebody to talk to. He fired them. They're gone. So it was him and only him. It was him and only him in his cell. It was him and only him in the cell besides the court. He was always alone. And so I think he may have created the victim role uh, as a shield of sorts. But I think he was always the victim in his life. I don't think he ever took accountability for absolutely anything. But the defendant, that little, little, little bit of emphasis on one word out of a sentence was enough to set him off. Could you imagine what it must have been like for poor Erica Patterson if she would have said the wrong word with the wrong intonation, he might have hit her, run her over, locked her in a closet, threatened her. I mean, you know, the thing is, you know, Nicholas Kirby and Corey tried to stop Erica at all costs from seeing Gerald Brooks Jr. And she was going to give him money. I'm just saying, what was this guy like? Before Waukesha, before what he did. What must it have been like to be around him if one word said with a little bit more emphasis than the others was enough to set him off like that? And mind you, he was chained. And there were an army of bailiffs ready to, you know, just jump if he tried to do anything. What do you think? 
I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope that you'll give it a thumbs up. I hope that you'll leave a comment. I hope that you'll subscribe to the channel. But I really want to know what you think about Jarrell Brooks Jr.'s response to the defendant.